My name is Laura Bryant. I'm the Southwest Florida Business Development Manager for Castle Group. If you're not familiar with Castle Group, we are a full service on-site property management company. Uh, so Shauna and I, Shauna is my counterpart, Shauna Fleischbein, I'll let her introduce herself and then we will get started with Monique. Hi everybody, I'm Shauna Fleischbein and like uh, Laura, I'm business development manager with Castle Group and I cover kind of the upper portion of the West Coast, Sarasota up through Tampa and uh, the northern portion and then into Orlando, Jacksonville. Um, so thank you all for joining us today and I'm going to hand it over to Monique, who's our, our star guest today. <laughs> I don't know about a star, but thank you so much, Shauna. Uh, my name is Monique Parker. I'm one of the founding partners of the law firm of Rabin Parker Gurley PA. Um, our primary office is in Clearwater, but we do have a Lakewood Ranch office and uh, satellite offices elsewhere. We serve communities essentially throughout the state of Florida, but Central Florida is, is our um, biggest concentration of community association clients. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me here today. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is amending your governing documents. Um, one of the reasons I love this subject is because it's what I do almost every day <laughs> at my law firm. Um, I handle all of the amendment projects that come through our doors. Um, I just, I, I find it an enjoyable part of the practice. So I, I like doing it. I like talking about it. So I will try to to make this, um, this webinar as informational as possible, but also hopefully uh, not terribly boring, which can sometimes be very challenging when we're talking about legal issues. So our agenda for today, we're going to talk about the hierarchy of laws and documents, how they interplay with each other, why you would amend your governing documents, the types of amendments you should consider, uh, how often should you be amending your governing document, and of course, probably the biggest section of this are sections that you want to consider amending and why you would want to do that. And then uh, last but not least, what's probably near and dear to your hearts is how you can save some money in the process of doing so. So I'll give you some tips and tricks on, on how you might approach the process to uh, save you uh, some pennies here and there. All right. And, and oh, I was just going to, I know I was, I didn't mean to um, interrupt you, Monique. I was just going to throw in there too. I forgot to mention, um, I know Laura mentioned you can ask questions all throughout. Yeah. So please feel free to type those in, but can you please try to keep them um, general? Um, if you have something that's very, very specific to your association, um, you're welcome to send that to us, to, to Monique, um, afterwards and be happy to try to help you the best we can. But um, for the sake of the webinar and, and time, we definitely want to try to keep those questions as um, general as possible. So thank right. you. <laughs> right. And, and then if you what I'll do is I'll take a break after each section and take questions that are related to that particular section in general. Um, so if as I'm talking, you think of something that is relevant to the topic we're on, definitely type out those questions. Um, if it's something else, we'll wait and try to catch any other questions at the end, because it's very likely that I might actually hit some things that answer your questions as we go through. So that way we can uh, keep it moving because it is only one hour and I can talk a long time. <laughs> I can just talk and talk and talk. So uh, I promise to get you guys out of here in an hour. All right. So jumping into the hierarchy of laws and governing documents, you know, when most people think about this, it's, you know, their initial instinct is to think, well, always state law is going to be over our governing documents. But um, interestingly, that's not exactly how it always works. Um, the, you know, the top, top dog cream of the crop are typically your federal laws. Those are the big guns that you can, um, you really can't, get around. And as it relates to community associations, the most common you're going to run into are, I'm sure you've heard the name, the Fair Housing Act. Um, that is where your comfort animals come into play, service animals, um, discrimination claims. Fair Housing Act is a big one. But you also have the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that you have to be aware of, especially when you're collecting assessments. And there are some others, but those are the two big ones that really um, face community association boards that you should be aware of. Um, state laws, of course, you have your state statutes. If you're a condominium, you have to deal with the Condominium Act. There's a Homeowner Association Act, the Cooperative Act. Um, one that you may not be as familiar with is the, um, uh, now I'm going to draw a blank on it, but it's the Business Act. You are all not-for-profit 
corporations. So there's the Florida Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, which is Chapter 617. That is one of the state laws that are governing you. And then, of course, we have case law. Case law is the challenging one, because unless you have an app set on your computer or phone that gives you notifications of different cases as they come down and how the courts are interpreting all these statutes and laws, it's incredibly difficult to keep up with that. Um, and we, are, we have both case law, or excuse me, both federal case law and state case law. So those are things that we as your counsel need to always be familiar with to make sure that we're staying on top of. Um, then we have the Florida Administrative Code. That's a big one for condominiums because your elections are governed by the code. Um, the arbitration process is governed by the Florida Administrative Code. So there are a lot of things in the Florida Administrative Code that you also need to be aware of. Local ordinances. Um, you could have local ordinances relating to how animals are going to be treated in your communities, the pet restrictions and leash laws. Um, there's also sometimes ordinances relating to business practices and residential areas that you have to be aware of. Um, so local ordinances, you can find them both in your counties as well as in your cities. So there's a number of them that you have to be aware of. Okay, so getting into the things that we're really more talking about today, um, your declaration of condominium, declaration of restrictions if you're an HOA, um, and then if you're a cooperative master form proprietary lease, that's the document that I like to say it governs the dirt. It contains most of the information of what you can and cannot do with your property, the piece of land or the share that you purchased. How does that work? What can you do with it? What can't you do with it? What are you restricted from um, that? So if you think about that document as the dirt document, that's the way I like to look at it. It's that baseline, the dirt document that you have to consider. And that's where most of your restrictions are going to be contained. The Articles of Incorporation is the document that gives life to the corporate entity that is your association. Like I said, we have the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. Well, that's where the Articles of Incorporation come into play. That's usually filed by your developer when the community is being formed and that gives life to the association. That document is basically going to contain information about who the initial directors were of your association, who the members are gonna be, what the powers of the association are. And that's one of the documents that we'll talk about a little bit more that be can become very obsolete. Actually not the document, but the information and it can become very obsolete over time. Your bylaws, the bylaws tell the board of directors and the corporate entity how to run the community. So that's kind of the how to, how to specially assess, how to call meetings, how to give notice. That's the document that really governs the corporation. So the articles give life to the corporation, but the bylaws govern the corporation. So I presume the vast majority of you here today in attendance are sitting on boards. And so that's the document that's telling you how to be a director and what you need to follow in order to make your community run appropriately. Last but not least, we have rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. Typically, but not always, those are the documents that are adopted by and changed by the board of directors only without having to have a membership vote. And those contain like the, I like to say, I don't like to call them least important, but the types of rules that need to be flexible, that should be and uh, subject to change periodically as the community adjusts and things um, may change and fluctuate over time. Architectural um, standards are a big one in that category because as we know, materials change over time, styles change over time. A house that was built in the 1960s may not want to look the same in 1990 versus 2015 versus, versus 2023. So we have to be flexible and allow for changes in materials, changes in design and styles. Um, so architectural standards fall under that category. Um, things such as what you can and can't do in the common areas for uh, condominiums. Smoking restrictions often fall into that category, even though you can have them in the declaration. Um, rules and regulations relating to pets and the uh, manner by which people need to pick up after their pets. You could have sign rules and regulations, pretty much any number of things. Another big one is um, your trash regulations. When does the trash go out? When does it have to be brought in? These are things that are too specific to be putting into the declaration. So you want to have those in rules and regulations so that you can flex with time. 
Now, the list you see on, on the board in front of you or on the um, page in front of you, that is the general hierarchy of things. So typically, from top to bottom, that's going to be the controlling factor. But very, very often, especially as it relates to state laws, the statutes, and the declaration articles and bylaws, there's going to be language in the Condominium Act and the Homeowner Association Act that says, unless the bylaws otherwise provide provide or unless the declaration states otherwise or if provided in the declaration of condominium. So there's this tricky language throughout the statutes and in all of the acts, the Condo Act, the Homeowner Association Act, the Cooperative Act, even some hidden in the um, Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, that it's going to basically kick the priority over into your governing documents. But if it's not in the governing documents, then the statute controls. So you have this interplay. There's also an issue when it comes to certain types of um, provisions that are less and more restrictive. For example, and we'll talk about this more when we get to why to amend, but in the bylaws, you're going to have provisions that require notice of your meetings. Your membership meetings typically require 14 days and your uh, director meetings, 48 hours notice. But your bylaws might say that you need to have 60 days notice for a membership meeting and 72 hours or four days for for a board meeting, depending on what it says. The statute says 14 days and 48 hours, but your bylaws, if they're more restrictive, then your bylaws control over what the statutes say, and you have to go with the more restrictive language. So it's not always as easy as going down the list and checking off, well, this is what the statute says, that trumps our bylaws, so therefore the statute is going to control. That's really not the way it works. There's a lot of interplay in these documents and the code and everything else. So um, that's one of the reasons going on to the, the next section that we'll talk about for amending your governing documents. So there's your hierarchy in the interplay. I doubt there's any questions about that, but if there are, um, have you seen any come in, Shauna? There was one question that came in. It's not specifically, it's, it's a general question, okay. um, but it's what would the process be or process be for amending monthly and special assessment condo fees from equal per unit to actual square footage? Oh, that's a really good one. And that actually will take us right into our next section. It works in perfectly with that. So reasons for amending the governing documents. Sometimes there are developer provisions that you want to change. And you know, developer provisions, remember when the developer was drafting those governing documents, what was the developer's purpose? The developer's purpose was to sell units, to sell lots and to sell property, and also to make sure that people who are buying those properties are able to obtain financing. The developer is far less concerned with the management and operation of the association after the turnover date. So the developer provisions that are located in your documents are really one of the number one reasons that you want to amend. However, as it relates to the question that was asked, unfortunately, Florida law does not let you change those provisions absent 100% approval of all of your members and 100% approval of all the lien holders of record, which basically means that if you have an association with 100 units, Every single one of those 100 unit owners need to vote in favor of changing from a flat line or excuse me, an equal assessment provision or equal sharing of the common elements, if you will, to something that is based on square footage. Now think about that practically. If you base it on square footage, then some owners are gonna get a break. Their assessments are going to go down. But those owners that have bigger units and more square footage, their assessments are necessarily going to go up. So do you think that they're going to vote in favor of it? Probably not. So it is a practical <laughs> possibility to get 100% to vote in favor of that. Uh, the other problem that you're going to run into is getting the lien holders to approve because you actually need 100% of all lien holders, which means every unit in your community that has a mortgage on it, you're going to have to get that mortgage company to go ahead and approve of those. So um, while there is a mechanism to do so, it really is a practical impossibility for just about every, every association throughout the state of Florida. That's one of the provisions that once the developer sets it, it's locked in after turnover and it cannot be changed, unfortunately. 
Okay, second one, inconsistency with current statutes and case law. So that's what I was talking about when I was mentioning the notice provisions and the bylaws. That's one of the big ones. Another one is, um, especially in older documents, sometimes you'll find this, where a document might state that no children under the age of 18 are permitted to reside in the community. Oftentimes you'll find that in condominium documents, um, but it can be in some HOA documents that are very old. The problem with that provision is unless you've been established as housing for older persons under the Fair Housing Act, the presence of that provision in the governing documents itself is a per se violation of the federal law. So there can be things buried in your documents that actually can, can trigger, you could get sued for it and actually be liable because that provision is in your governing documents if you have not established yourself as a 55 and older community. So you always want to be careful, especially if you have older documents, to make sure that everything in it is consistent with certain laws that could uh, get you in trouble if you're not careful. Um, Insurance provisions, that's a big one today, a very big one today. I am drafting insurance provision uh, changes for condominiums and townhomes, I would say weekly for our communities. Um, if you're in a condominium, you know the challenges associated with getting insurance at the current time. Um, townhome communities that were set up with insurance provisions where they insure very similar to condominiums are now trying to change to insure more um, like an HOA ordinarily would because they're not able to get the insurance that they need. So insurance provisions are a big one to look at right now. We actually just recently had a um, condominium community that required a certain level of insurance that was beyond more than what the statutes actually called for. And they just could not get that. So by virtue of the fact that they couldn't get the type of coverage that their declaration required, they were in violation of their own declaration. So we, we amended to kind of lessen that restriction so that um, their provision now says to the extent available in the market, then they're required to do it. Um, so insurance is a big one, one to change. Also, um, case law I put in there. So here's a really good example of where you need to consider your um, restrictions. A lot of associations will have a restriction that talks about um, ownership after purchase. So um, you maybe need to own a unit for two or three years or actually 12 months, I think is more common. Um, you have to own your unit or your lot for 12 months before you're able to rent it. So years ago, a lot of these provisions were drafted by attorneys and it said, you know, no owner may rent their unit within 12 months after purchase period, end of story. And that's all the provision contained. Well, we've litigated, <laughs> we've litigated those provisions. And believe me when I tell you, there are a lot of loopholes that the courts have upheld. Um, we've had people who have established an LLC and made their tenants like a one one thousandth owning member of the LLC, and therefore it was not a lease, but they, you know, were actually entitled to do this as an owner of the LLC. Um, so that was one way they got around it. Another one was an agreement for deed that wasn't even recorded in the public records. It was so clearly a lease, but they executed something called an agreement for deed instead that they were going to pay, you know, X amount of dollars in exchange for the potential of buying this unit later. It was just all kinds of creative things to get around it. Um, and so we've had to modify those restrictions to be even more specific. Instead of saying that they can't lease for the first year, we, all, we say that nobody can occupy a unit other than a bona fide owner. And then we define bona fide owner as somebody that owns at least one third of the total equity in the property as reflected in the public records of the county. So um, that's, that's what you need to have in your documents. Otherwise, they can circumvent those restrictions very easily. All right. Uh, communities change over time and common practices change over time. That's one of the things that we've just talked about, um, especially as it relates to um, architectural standards. But another one, think about it a long time ago, pickup trucks were a big thing. A lot of communities said, you know, no pickup trucks may be parked in our community. Um, nowadays, there are some pickup trucks that, you know, cost $100,000. They're beautiful. And, you know, owners are wondering, why on earth can I not park my beautiful pickup truck here when, you know, other people have beat up old, you know, um, boards from 1960 with dents and dings and everything else. 
So common practices definitely change over time and, and you may want to update your governing documents so that um, you can address those common practices and get rid of obsolete things. Um, Actually, the next one, remove unnecessary and or obsolete provisions, um, not only relating to what I was just talking about, but also the developer language. If your documents haven't been amended and restated since turnover, there are more likely than not several provisions in there that relate to the developer's rights. And those can cause a lot of confusion um, with people and, and they're just unnecessary clean up your document by getting rid of all of those obsolete developer provisions um, that are no longer necessary. And then last but not least, generally clarifying and simplifying the documents. Um, that's a catch-22 for me as I'm drafting because of what I said with, uh, you know, like the leasing provisions. So we want to get rid of all of the legalese that you don't need. We want to take out that language that is cumbersome, all the, you know, here to afters and all the, the nonsense language that you don't really need and try to draft your documents in a language that is very easy to follow, very easy for anybody to read. However, that being said, there are certain provisions where we have to include a little more complex type of drafting to address what we know is happening in the court system. For example, like I said, that, that leasing restriction, we've had to add a whole bunch of other stuff into it and made it, you know, what used to be a one liner now takes three paragraphs to address. But the reason for that is not because we're trying to, you know, be legalistic in our writing, but it's because we're addressing known problems in the court system as it relates to interpreting those provisions. Because this is a contract, right? I should have said that in the outset. All of these documents are contracts between and amongst the association and the member. Membership. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure that everybody that's a party to the contract can understand it and read it clearly, but also that it can be applied clearly going forward, because that is really, you know, the biggest reason, the overarching reason is to make your community easy to operate. You don't want confusion. You don't want ambiguity in your documents. You don't want your, your residents to question, you know, well, how does this really work and what does this mean? Because I can't really even understand some of the words that are used in this. We want it all to be a very easy document for everybody to read and understand and to know how it applies to them and what they're required to do under the terms of those documents. So that takes us to the end of this section. Laura, I yeah, like there's a question. Yeah, we've got a question. Jasmine asked uh, if the verbiage is not specific in the governing documents, can the board add verbiage and amend without community vote? Great question. Um, no, you cannot. But what you can do is if, you know, the ideal is to amend the governing documents, but if you cannot get your members to um, approve of an amendment for whatever reason, the board can adopt a resolution clarifying a otherwise ambiguous or confusing provision. Um, it, can, it has to be consistent. There can't be a conflict. You can't, it can't be, you know, nobody can have a swing set in the front of their house and you're gonna say, well, we're gonna clarify that to say no swing sets with two swings, but you can have a swing set with three swings, you know? So it's, it still has to be consistent, but yes, can adopt a resolution to clarify. And a lot of times we see that with maintenance um, provisions where it, you know communities may have a hard time getting the approval that they need to amend the governing documents. And there are just maintenance restrictions that are absolutely missing. They just don't exist. And so what we always recommend is going to the past pattern and practice of the community to address those maintenance provisions. And so you can do that by board adopted resolution. And you would say something along the lines of, you know, our documents are ambiguous with regard to these maintenance provisions. And, you know, the board believes in the best interest of the members to clarify the past pattern and practice of the association as it relates to how these improvements have been maintained over the years since developer turnover. Now, therefore, this is what we're clarifying. And so you can do that by resolution. I would strongly recommend you work with an attorney to do that. And I just realized, so on my screen, Laura and Shauna are on, <laughs> on the right hand. So whenever I keep looking at them, which means it probably <laughs> looks like I'm looking off into the distance, so I'm going to move that little box to the middle so I don't get into the habit. There we go. Now I'm not looking. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I don't really have wandering eyes. I promise. <laughs> okay. Next section, types of amendments. This is a quick one, but I think it's important um, to consider. So there's 
two types of amendments generally, and then we'll talk about what I refer to as a hybrid. You have individual section amendments. This is where um, you decide as a board that, look, our insurance provision, it has some language that you know we can't meet anymore because of the marketplace. So we need to get this out of our governing documents so that we're not inconsistent with what the law requires. And then you would come to your attorney or to me and say, can you help us amend this section? It's like article four, section B of our declaration. And we would amend just that one section. And that would go out to your members. Your members would vote on just that one section. They would approve it. It would have underlining and strike through in it to show exactly how it was being amended, amended in most cases. And then once that was done, that'd be recorded in the public records and it would be an individual amendment to the body of the document that is the declaration. And you can do that innumerable amount of times. I think we had a question come in before the webinar even started. How many times can you do it? You do it as many times as you want. The problem you have is over time as you do these individual section amendments. And by the way, you can do more than one at a time even. You could have a document that has four or five individual section amendments that you put out to the members and they vote on all four or five of them individually. Um, but over time, what happens is recording in the public records are all these different amendments and it becomes challenging for your members to compile all of that and make sure they understand all of the changes that have been made. So mm -hmm. it's perfectly okay and reasonable to do that. Um, I would suggest that most associations commonly do it as a routine practice over the years because you just have to. Sometimes you just have to address it. It's not practical to amend and restate every single time that you have you know, a couple things that you need to tweak. So those are individual section amendments. They have their benefits, they have their drawbacks. Then we have what we refer to as amended and restated documents. The amended and restated process, um, what that does is first, you compile any individual amendments that have been made over time into the original declaration. So if you've changed a section, when that declaration is compiled together, everything is blended in the way that it would be. So in those individual amendments, if something is stricken out, then that's gonna be deleted from the original declaration. Something that's underlined, it's gonna be added in. So that at the end of the compilation process, the declaration is going to read all of the amendments as they exist on that given day. By the way, side note, you can actually do an unofficial compiled declaration as well. So if you have many amendments you've made over the years, I still would say work with an attorney to do it just to make sure you don't accidentally miss something, but you can compile that declaration and, and have a working document as long as you make sure that you tag it at the top as unofficial, please consult the public records and have all the appropriate caveats. But sometimes that can be beneficial if you have a lot of individual amendments and you're not having any luck getting an amended and restated done. Sorry, sidebar there. But anyways, um, Sometimes I just follow that little rabbit hole. You know, I can't help myself. <laughs> but, Excuse um, me in this industry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so my brain is just firing at all you know, different <laughs> places. Um, so, yeah, so the amended restated, you start with that compilation. And then we go through your declaration as it exists today and recommend to the association all of the different amendments that would address the reasons that we just talked about. You know, what in there might be inconsistent with statute? What might we need to embellish to make sure that we are going to be, for these provisions are gonna be enforceable under governing case law if something were to be challenged? How can we clarify the maintenance restrictions? Are there any new uh, use restrictions that we need to add? And we'll talk more about all of that in a minute when we get to all of the different sections. But we would go through and we would draft amendments into that one document. So what the board would then receive at the end of the process that your lawyer uh, finishes is a document that has all of these proposed amendments in one document. And then the board would go through that and say, well, we like this, we don't like that, you know, maybe change this, can we modify that? Uh, oh, by the way, we don't have this improvement anymore, so can you delete that? So it's an interactive process between the board and its council to turn this document into something that is actually going to be a single solo approved document by the membership. The beauty of it is when it's done so that the first document is going to be messy. The way it goes out to the members, it's going to be messy. It's going to contain, contain all of that underlining and strike through. Um, it, that's going to show all the changes as you go through it. So it's not really pleasant to read through at that point in time. But the beauty of it is when you're done, 
the document that actually gets recorded in the public records and that you will distribute to the members afterwards or at least make available to the members is a nice, clean, brand new document without all of the messy underlining and strike through all of the current amendments. It's all consistent with governing law and statutes. Also, a good attorney that practices in community association law will know how to um, incorporate language that will make the document more flexible as statutes change in the future. So you don't need to go back to the well that frequently. Um, so it's a great, great project to embark on. You know, I well, we'll get to when in a moment, but it's you know, it's good to do periodically just so that you have a nice, clean, and easy document to read and, and refer to. Now. What I'm talking about in the hybrid voting process, subsection C, is if you are amending and restating your declaration, and that's, let's face it, that's the one that can be the most contentious, because as I mentioned, remember, that's the dirt. That's what you can and can't do with your beloved home, and people can be very protective of their home, right? Every man's home is his castle. So when you're telling people what they can and can't do in and around their castle, they can become very defensive and adversarial. So you have to be careful. And one of the things that you may want to amend, a, a great example, um, would be leasing restrictions. When, when can you rent your property? How often? How you know, long can the term be? Um, that can be a provision that can get a little bit sticky and people can get very fiery about that. So what we can do is we can still have a nice amended and restated declaration. But if you know in advance that a particular provision might be adversarial, with careful drafting, we can do so in a manner that will allow the members to vote on that section individually, but still preserve the entire government, the entire amended and restated declaration. So it would still be one document, but the voting process would look something like, do you approve of article proposed article five section C of the amended and restated declaration as it relates to leasing restrictions, yes or no? And then the next would be, do you approve of all of the other proposed amendments to the amended and restated declaration, yes or no? So you are still voting in a lump sum, but if that leasing restriction is going to be something that could tank the entire project, you want to separate it, let them vote on that separately. So if that fails, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. so sometimes you want to consider that hybrid voting when you have contentious. Parking can be contentious. Pets can be contentious. Uh, leasing. Those are the three. Believe it or not, parking. Those are the three that we see sometimes that are the most contentious among um, residents. And so that allows you to still do an amended and restated, even if you have something that the board feels is in the best interest. And maybe the majority of your owners seem to want, but you want, don't want to take a chance. And the reason I say it has to be careful drafting is because if your attorney doesn't draft it in a manner that um, can be read clearly and easily, whether it passes or not, you can wind up with some really awkward language because now everything else passes, but that you have this very awkward sounding section in the middle of your document that doesn't blend and flow. So you have to draft it in a way that whichever Whichever way it goes, whether it passes or doesn't pass, the document still flows nicely. So, okay, any questions on those? Yeah, I think we've had quite a few yeah. come in between the last section and this section. One, <laughs> one that comes to this specifically amendments. Amendments, the question is amendments take place at annual meeting? Question Not mark. Yeah, not necessarily. You can do them at, a, at an annual meeting, but you can also call a special meeting of the members at any time to vote on proposed amendments. Um, the statute requires all the statutes, condos, cooperatives, homeowner association, uh, 14 days notice of the meeting at which the um, voting is going to take place. But again, your bylaws might say something else for special meetings of the members, so you have to um, check on that. But it can be done at a special meeting. And you do need to send out the proposed amendments in advance of the meeting along with that notice. So you're sending the notice and the proposed amendments so the owners can review what you're proposing in the process. Um, there's one that came in that I think is important um, to probably mention because people do get confused by members, residents, renters, you know, what rights do renters have, you know, so. Can a board lock residents out of a portion of their clubhouse ballroom if the bylaws state the clubhouse is, quotation, is for the sole and exclusive use of the members? So I'm sorry, can they do what there? 
it sounds like they're trying to, they want to know if they can prevent residents from using part okay. of the clubhouse or ballroom if right. the bylaws state that yeah. it's for sole and exclusive use of members. Yeah, um, no, and the reason is because there's provision in the law that says when a, um, when a unit is rented, the tenant has all of the rights that the owner would have as if the owner were personally present. So there are very few things that you can exclude a tenant, very few rights that you can exclude a tenant from exercising that the owner still maintains. One is voting rights. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is actually you can have a restriction that allows only owners to have pets and tenants can't have pets. That's been a right. uh, But those are the few. Uh, access to the common areas and common elements, you have to give the tenants all the same access that you would give an owner. Um, so tenants, residents, their guests, all of that, yeah, you have to make it available. Even by amendment to the declaration, you wouldn't be able to exclude them. Um, another one that's always one that gets brought up quite often, workshops. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> workshops are not mentioned in 720 or our governing documents. Workshops are being conducted when a quorum of the board is present and discuss community association matters. No motions or votes are taken. Is this actually a board meeting? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, in this sense, yeah. you, you don't have to have meeting minutes. Right. You don't have to, you know, follow any corporate formalities in that sense, but you do have to have it open. You have to give notice and allow the members to attend. Yeah. So, but it's, you know, I, it's not, I, I said, yes, kind of tongue in cheek. It's not a meeting. It is a workshop, but it still is subject whenever, no matter what, whenever you have a quorum of the board in one place discussing matters that relate to the association, the notice and open meeting requirements have to be maintained. You, you can't have a closed workshop, even, even if it relates to confidential matters, it has to be open. The only, only time you can have a closed workshop is if you're meeting with your attorney to discuss um, potential litigation or pending litigation, or if you're meeting to discuss personal issues. Those are the only two exceptions to the rule. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we we've had that question often, and um, you know, a town hall meeting or or workshop is where boards can have a discussion, open discussion. They're not making motions, um, and then the agenda items are still noticed and posted, right? Where they would typically be posted at the association, and proper notice is given. Owners are welcome to attend, but to my knowledge, they don't have to. Again, it's not like it's not ran like a board meeting where you're getting each owner gets three minutes to speak on each item. Correct. This is an opportunity for the board to have open discussion without making the decision. Correct. There's no motions made. Right. So when you have a motion made or you're, you know, really discussing something where decisions are going to be made, you have to let the members talk. But yeah, yeah, if it's just a general discussion, you have to have, you have to have it uh, noticed, let them attend, let them listen in. Um, but you don't have to take the three minute, you know, right. topic conversation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have some more questions coming in several, a lot. Shauna, um, Let's see, does a restated document have to be actually sent to members or can it just be available to everyone on the association's website? Um, that's going to depend on whether you're an HOA or a condominium or cooperative. Condominium and cooperatives, you do need to send the document to them in advance. In an HOA, there is a provision where you can actually send the amendments afterwards. I don't recommend it. I never recommend it. Um, I've never seen a situation where it's gone over well when it hasn't been sent out. Um, but again, if you're an HOA and you want to make them available electronically prior to then you can do that. Um, just make sure that you really let people know how to access them, that they're available, because that's that's the number one issue where I see that um, amendments fail, especially amended and restated projects. And we'll get to this on the saving money part of it. Um, the number one reason that they fail is because the community feels like they weren't involved enough in the process or they weren't given enough notice. And so they, you know, they, they yell about transparency. You weren't transparent. We didn't see it. We, you're trying to sneak something by us and they get very, very angry. So, um, I always recommend sending it out, bite the bullet because the cost of the mailing is much less than the cost of going through the process. So you don't want to take a chance pinching those pennies and you know winding up losing everything just because you saved a few dollars on the mailing side of it. So I always recommend sending the whole thing out in advance. And then the nice thing with an HOA is 
if you don't, if you do send it out in advance, which is better for your members, it makes them happier. You don't have to send it out afterwards. So you got to send it either way. So if you've right. got to send it either way, I say send it out in advance and avoid the argument that you, know, you didn't. So yeah. we've got another one just for clarification. Uh, Pam stated, uh, you, you say that owners may have pets, but tenants may be excluded from this. So we can say a renter cannot have a pet, even if it is a service dog. Not if it's a service animal. Service and ESAs, those are totally separate and distinct. Um, they're not pets, but you can you can amend your declaration. By the way, that has been um, challenged as a rule, um, a board adopted rule. The pet, you know, tenants can't have pets and owners can. Um, and some courts have upheld the rules. Some have said it needs to be in the declaration. So I always recommend putting it in the declaration just to be safe, as opposed to just a board adopted rule on that. But yeah, no ESAs and, and service animals. Think about them this way as a service animal, an emotional support animal, it's considered a medical device. So you have to think about it as, you know, you could never adopt an amendment that would prevent a tenant from having a medical device. So you can't have one that would prevent them. And same with a guest, even guests, you have to allow guests to come on with their emotional support or service animals as well. One of our rabbit hole topics in the industry, yes. right? <laughs> yeah, you want to have a long webinar. Let's go on that one for yeah, right. questions. Exactly. Um, the one another one Barbara asked, is there any process difference to amending bylaws versus CCRs? Yes and no. Um, technically, no. Practically speaking, I'm going to say yes, and this is why, at least from my practice and what I do. Um, and I was actually going to address this in saving money, but it's not one of our bullet points, so it's a good, point, a good time to do it here. Um, there's a provision in the law that allows you to avoid the whole underlining and strike through process if using the underlining and strike through would actually hinder the reader's understanding of the amendments more so than um, assisting the understanding of the amendments. But that being said, in the declaration, um, you should never do that. If you're amending and restating your declaration, no matter how confusing it is, I always recommend, especially in an amend and restate it, always, always, always recommend putting in the underlining and strike through. Individual section amendments, not so much, that's not that big of a deal. But if you're amending and restating your declaration, put all of those underlining and strike throughs in there. Even if there have been times where I feel like the amendment would be confusing, I'll just strike through the entire section and rewrite the whole section over again in the body of the document. So don't risk a challenge to your declaration by not doing that. The difference, practically speaking, in bylaws and articles, is I've never really seen a successful challenge to a complete entire rewrite of the bylaws and articles, which can be very beneficial for a lot of reasons. One, there's a you can reorganize your bylaws and your articles in a manner that is much more simple, much more clear. Um, and concise and consistent with current law if you just do them as a whole new set of bylaws. And not only that, but you save the time and the money that you incur in doing the compilation. So if you were going to do the underlining and strike through, you have to first compile in all of the amendments to the bylaws that you've done over the years. So there's time involved in that. There's time involved in drafting the underlining and strike throughs and then the recording. So um, if you're using underlining and strike through while you're still only recording a cleaner document, it typically winds up being a thicker document because you still just kind of the old language can be redundant and everything. Um, so a brand new set of bylaws or a brand new set of articles um, can be prepared with a statement in the beginning of it that says substantial rewarding of original bylaws. Please see current bylaws for or current text or something like that. Um, we put that at the beginning of it. And then with you, it just saves money and time because you get a nice clean document right from the outset. You don't have to, um, it saves on your mailing costs too, because the documents are going to have fewer pages, at least for those two documents. And really, you know, with the articles too, um, articles of incorporation for an existing community association uh, don't need to be more than like two or three pages. They're very, very short. So it helps a lot. So I would say that's the biggest difference is whether or not you have to have the underlining and strike through versus not having it. And it's more of a practical than a legal distinction. Okay. 
We have a couple more. We'll do kind of rapid fire because I know we still have a good amount to um, to <laughs> cover here. Um, I think this one is being asked because they're probably trying to figure out where it fits into maybe including it or amending. But um, Katrina asked, um, we have an HOA and want to assess fees for repeat offenders that destroy sod and sprinkler heads. What is the best direction to take with it? So I would say as it relates to that, when, you, when you're talking about fees, um, there's a number of ways to interpret that. First, I would say use your finding process. And you actually, even if your documents are silent on finding procedures, the statutes both for, well, for all three, condos, cooperatives, and homeowners association, allow you to implement a finding process without even having to amend your governing documents. So if you have repeat offenders, you might want to use the finding process. If you're an HOA, that can be particularly effective. And if you're mentioning Sod, I'm going to assume for the moment that you probably are an HOA, um, because in a homeowners association, any fine that reaches a thousand dollars or more in the aggregate can actually become a lien against the property, um, and all of that comes into play even without an amendment. So um, that's something that you want to consult with your council about or your management company about adopting finding procedures. As far as mm -hmm. recovering, if you're talking about fees. For example, uh, that relate to maybe self-help where the association is doing it and then charging for it. We're going to talk about that in a minute under the specific provisions that you should amend. Um, let's see. Are there other items? Uh, are there other items that require 100% vote approval? You mentioned fee structure earlier. Reserves? Question mark. Yeah, reserves do not. Um, you in a condominium, you have to have certain reserve categories. That's by statute that can't be changed. Um, but there's you can use reserves for a different purpose by a vote of the members. That's a um, a majority of those who participate provide a quorum is obtained. So you don't. It's not a hundred percent threshold vote for moving or using reserves for another purpose. Um, the only other one that's a hundred percent approval plus lien holders is changing any appurtenances to the unit, which does kind of fall in line with the percentages as well. Um, but if your documents say that each unit shall have one parking space assigned to it as an appurtenance to the unit, while your homeowners may be able to assign those parking spaces, you could not take away the parking spaces and say, you know what, nobody's going to have an assigned parking space anymore. From now on, they're all going to be, you know, first come first serve parking spaces. And, you know, we're just going to share them equally. That that wouldn't work because now you're you're removing what has been an appurtenance to a unit and that would require 100% approval. So that would be the only other one. Um, actually, another another interesting one, very common for condominiums. I see people make this mistake all the time patios in the back of your units you cannot expand a patio or a terrace or anything like that um, beyond the original footprint without 100 percent approval because anything beyond the original footprint in a condominium is common element so if you were to tell a homeowner oh yeah your patio in your rear patio is five by five that's your limited common element but we're going to let you extend it out three feet and over five more feet and have a bigger patio, what you've just done is you've taken that land, that common element land away from all the other owners, which is an appurtenance, and you've assigned it now to just one individual owner. So patios are a big thing. You can't in the condominium context, allow owners to have bigger patios that extend down to the common elements without 100% approval. And we see this happen all the time. Um, that's, that's a bad thing. And if it's happened in your community, you need to kind of stop it and then adopt a resolution saying, we're not going to do it anymore more once they have to, once they're removed for maintenance purposes or have to be repaired they have to come back to the original size etc cetera, etc cetera. so okay. all right well we'll go ahead and move on because okay. we have we're running out of time you still have a good amount to cover yes. and but what we'll do is we'll hold the questions till yep. the end and so these people can stay on if they want to get the, the their Perfect. questions answered if that works for you yeah, that works for me. I have okay. um, I have nothing after this webinar um, until I have to eat because I get hangry. So that should, that should give <laughs> you another five, full five minutes at least. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> yeah, How are you? Well, no. <laughs> 
how often, this is a quick one. Um, you should be reviewing. So, well, actually, let me start with this. Obviously, if something comes up and it's not workable, then, you know, that's live time. That's real time. As a board of directors, you have a fiduciary obligation to operate your community in the best interest of the members. So if you just know because of your day-to-day -day business that you're conducting that something isn't working and should be amended, or if something like insurance becomes a problem because of what's happening in the marketplace, um, then that's something that, you know, live time, you should, you should be addressing by amendment if necessary. Um, but if you're, if there's nothing really that's come up um, and you kind of glance at your governing documents, you see, you know, we've not amended anything for a couple of years. I would say review them, you know, go through your governing documents, look through them either as a board or appoint a committee to review them and see if there's something in there that, you know, maybe you should consider amending. You've attended this webinar, go back and look at your documents. Is there anything that we've talked about in the webinar that might be lurking in your documents you didn't realize that you want to consider amending? So I usually recommend every two to three years, sitting down, really reading through your documents and looking for anything that might raise some red flags. And then I always recommend amending and restating every 10 to 15 years. That way, any of those individual amendments that you do over time can be blended in, everything can be brought up to date. And the nice thing about it is if you do that consistently and if you do it with a community association lawyer, I'm not going to say me, although I'd like to but <laughs> I'm really good at it. No, but um, if you do it with a, a, a experienced, and, and I'm, I'm really not picking on anybody, but this is very, very important. If you amend and restate, if you're going to amend and restate, please, please, please do so with an experienced community association lawyer, not just an experienced lawyer and not just an ex uh, community association lawyer. Both categories should be met, experienced community association lawyer, because this is a big project and you want to make sure it's done right. And if you do it right, then your future amended and restated projects should be very inexpensive. There won't be that much that you're going to need to update and amend. It'll be more in the compilation pro process, you know, things that you've done maybe over that 10 or 15 years that need to be compiled into it. And then, you know, any tweaks that need to be made because of case law or statutory changes that, you know, maybe couldn't have been anticipated. But like I said, good community association lawyer that amends and restates is going to be able to put some flexibility into those documents so that every time the law changes, you don't have to run back to your declaration to update it. So um, amend and restate every 10 to 15 years. All right. Now, here's the meat and potatoes. And I think, look at my clock over there. We got at least 10 minutes to talk about yeah. this. And if we, um, we go over a little bit, that's okay. Okay. So what specific provisions should you consider amending, whether these are individual or whether these are in an amended and restated process? project. And you can read the screen, so I don't have to talk in detail about all of them. Uh, transfers, leasing, and occupancy, though, I will mention a couple things about that. Um, if you're a homeowners association, you, you may already know this, but the law was recently changed to say that when you amend your leasing restrictions, those amendments, if they they require any type of um, minimum lease term that's less than six months, it's only going to be effective against those members who vote in favor of that amendment, um, or excuse me, greater than six months. It's only going to be effective against those who vote in favor of those amend that amendment and those who take title after. And there are certain other tweaks to that as well. Um, that's been in the Condominium Act and the Cooperative Act for a while. But as Airbnb, or I should actually, I guess it's now VRBO. I think they sold the VRBO. But let's just say the transient rental um websites. As those get more and more popular, and as the lobbyists for those entities um, have more and more money, they are pushing for restrictions in the law that would prohibit associations from regulating leasing, short-term, transient, vacation rental leasing entirely. Now, there's a, an aspect in the law that you can't retroactively impact a contract, right? So if you get these things into your governing documents, any type of leasing restrictions, um, maybe prohibiting very short-term rentals, if you get those into the governing documents before statutes change, they can't retroactively impair your contractual provisions. Um, so it is important to consider your transfer and leasing provisions now before the laws change in the next few years to make it harder to change those provisions. Um, like I said, there's already some provisions in the law that's making it challenging to begin with, and I anticipate that it might get more challenging over the next few years. Um, occupancy, that's a big one. A lot of 
older documents will say uh, no lease shall be approved um, or no lease shall be commenced without approval of the association. Some of them will say all leases require approval of the association. Well, what's a lease? Think about it. A lease is actually a document, right? It's actually not necessarily the person. In certain cases, I've held that if the leasing provision isn't clear that the occupants have to actually be approved, um, that the association only has the right to approve the form and content of the actual paper document and not the occupants. And really what you care about are the occupants. We don't even want our clients involved in what the, the document lease has. That's a contract between the owner and the, the tenant, not us. We stay out of that. But the association wants to know who's residing in the units, who's residing in our dwellings. Are they people that we want in our community? Do they have criminal histories? Are we concerned about sexual predators and offenders? So occupancy restrictions have to be specific. Just because you have a leasing restriction, it may not be worded well enough to actually protect against certain occupancy issues. Mm -hmm. Same with transfers. We had a community association, it was an HOA, that never really wanted to regulate transfers in the community. They figured people should be able to sell their homes without any type of involvement from the association. And that's great. But then they had a sexual predator buy a unit or buy a home in the community and everybody went crazy and wanted to know how to you know, do something about it. And um, at that point in time, it was too late. We said, you don't have anything in your documents that would address that. So they amended, but it couldn't retroactively impair his right to purchase his home. So, um, you know, they can address that issue in the future, but they didn't have anything in place to address that when it happened. And so a lot of times that type of issue, you don't really think about it until it occurs. So that's something that you want to consider. Are there certain types of people that we may want to, you know, exclude? Um, and that's another rabbit hole that we don't have time to go down, um, but definitely work with your counsel on those because there are certain things that you can and can't do with regard to the occupancy restrictions um, because of discrimination concerns. Maintenance provision. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but especially in condominiums and townhomes, um, your maintenance provisions can be either confusing or more commonly ambiguous or just wholly lacking. Um, a lot of times there's just not enough the way it was drafted. It'll say, you know, the uh, unit owner is responsible for everything other than what the association is responsible for. Boom. And then there's arguments to be made. Well, you know, where are the boundaries of the unit? And what is, you know, really, what does that mean? Who takes care of, you know, lines such as electrical wiring that serves only the unit, but lays outside of the unit. So maintenance provisions almost always can be clarified. Um, insurance provisions, we've already talked about that, so we don't need to talk about that again. Assessment provisions, uh, the big one for assessment provisions is, do your assessment provisions give a pass to the lenders for their responsibility under the statute? So the law says that if a lender um, forecloses on a unit and takes title, the lender is responsible for 12 months of past two assessments or 1% um, of loan, whichever is less. And that's provided for in all different, all three acts, the Condominium Cooperative and Homeowner Association Act. But a lot of times we find in the documents a provision that says the lenders are not responsible for any assessments that came due prior to the, um, the acquisition of that property through foreclosure. And that means that you cannot collect that 1% or 12 months against that lender. Sometimes it's even worse. It'll say the lender or anybody who takes title through the lender. So then even the next person that takes title from the lender is not responsible. So you wanna make sure that you're entitled to all of your statutory rights in, that, in those assessment provisions. Pet restrictions, we kind of talked about that. Um, incidentally, don't include um, emotional support, animal and service animal restrictions in your governing documents. Um, keep your governing documents related to pets. Um, your rules can be related to the care and, and um, upkeep of animals on the property. So that way it covers both. But what you don't want to do is put in your declaration um, the mechanism by which everybody can circumvent your pet restrictions, because <laughs> that's really what you're doing. You're like, OK, but if you have an ESA, this is how you need to do it. So. Let people with emotional support animals and service animals, you know, let them go through the process that they need to go through. You don't need to lay it out in your governing documents. And the bigger reason for not laying it out is the law changes 
quickly in that area, especially the case laws. And so you could put something in your governing documents that right now is consistent with law. And six months from now, a case can come down saying you can't ask people to provide that. And then immediately your governing documents are not only inconsistent with law, but you might have a per se violation of the law in your governing documents. So don't put anything in your declaration relating to emotional support or service animals. Just keep that out. Establish that with your lawyer as policy that can be quickly amended by the board of directors. Those are policy issues, not declaration issues. Um, parking restrictions, uh, no need to really talk about that. Self-help provisions, okay. Um, yes, we still have a bit of time. I've got to tell you this. Yeah. Recently, case law has come down saying that if you have provisions in your governing documents that allows your association to take self-help measures. In other words, a good example is if a homeowner um, has not uh, been maintaining the exterior of his or her dwelling or lot, sometimes you'll have provisions that say, in the event after notice, a homeowner fails to maintain his or her dwelling in the manner required by this declaration, then the board of directors at its discretion may enter upon the lot, shall not be liable for trespass, can take all of the actions necessary to restore the lot to good and attractive condition, and the homeowner is responsible for all those costs. That seems like a great provision to have in your governing documents. People love that because then you can get things done. The problem is new case came out and said that if that is in your governing documents, it's not an option anymore. You have to, you have to do that before you can go to court and require the owner to do it. It basically stands in the way of seeking injunctive relief. And the outfall of that is very, very problematic because just think about it. Do you really want to go on to somebody's lot and repaint their home? What happens if the owner comes out and starts screaming at you and, and tells your agent to get off of their property? If you go on to their lot and mow their lawn, how many times are you going to have to do that? Do you have to just keep doing it indefinitely? What about sod? If the sod is in bad condition, is the association really going to be responsible for getting a company to come in, rip up all the old sod and put in the new sod? How far does it go? It's a very, very big problem right now. Um, and, and the courts are uniformly upholding this, that if you have that provision in your governing documents, as it relates to all violations, the association is required to exercise that self-help before the courts will step in and require an owner to do it. So if you have self-help provisions, they have to be amended. There are a number of ways that we can amend them. Unfortunately, um, we don't have time to go into that, but work with your counsel. If your counsel is not familiar with the cases that I'm talking about, he or she will be soon enough. <laughs> Let them get in touch with me and I'll explain it to them. I'll send them the case law citations. Um, but this is a relatively new problem. I would say in the past eight months or so, this has become a major problem for associations. And while it's a bigger issue for homeowners associations, it still does apply to condominiums and cooperatives as well. Um, amendment provisions, I think we had a question that came in earlier. If our documents require 90% approval to amend, what can we do? Well, there's not a whole lot you can do other than amend that provision, but you're going to need 90% approval to amend that provision. Um, the two recommendations I would have is one, um, don't try to amend and restate your documents until you change that provision to be more reasonable. Um, I like to change amendment provisions to be a percentage of those who participate in the voting provided a quorum is obtained. You can even say provided a majority of the members participate because an HOA quorum can often be um, only one third. So uh, that's a sliding scale type of amendment provision. And what that does is it makes every owner's vote that is actually cast count. But those who are apathetic, who don't bother to cast a vote, don't actually count as a no vote working against your ability to amend. So you want to get those amendment provisions changed if you can. Um, uh, helpful helpful way to do that is you typically have, unless your governing documents are weird, you typically have 160, 150 days to get the project done because you can typically send out your notice of the membership meeting and the proposed amendments up to 60 days in advance of the meeting. And then if at the date of the meeting, 60 days later, if you don't have sufficient support for the amendment, and it looks like if you get additional proxies, you may be able to get it to pass. 
you can adjourn and reconvene to a later date and time up to 90 days after the date of the meeting. So you have 60 days prior and 90 days after to gather as many proxies and votes in favor of the proposed amendments as possible. And that relates to all amendments, not just changing the amendment process. But you know, if you're getting stuck, I encourage you to take advantage of as much time as you can in the process. Again, that's something that has to be done in a specific way. So do work with your council to make sure that you do it correctly and you don't accidentally um, mess that up and, and close it at the meeting when you think you still have 90 additional days. Um, updating use restrictions in general. We kind of talked about that throughout, obviously those old pickup truck provisions, parking restrictions, flag provisions, sign provisions. Sign provisions are a big one. Um, signs have been interpreted to literally mean signs. So if you don't also restrict banners, flags, <laughs> um, you know, boards, everything. You kind of have to be a little bit more uh, specific when you're talking about signs. Don't just say signs. You want to update those restrictions as well. That's um, another one that over time, like now it's become very popular for the happy birthday signs yes. or even the graduation, you know, at the end of the year, the high schools, exactly. a lot of them do the senior signs. And I know in my own HOA, that's been like a whole, whole yep. thing, you know, <laughs> political signs, you know, during political signs, events, you know, so you want to, and yes, you can prohibit political signs if you want to. Um, I like to make sign restrictions in the declaration basically state that signs, banners, flags, anything displaying, you know, content is subject to rules and regulations adopted by the board of directors from time to time. So that way you have it in the declaration, but then there's that flexibility to modify it as you need to over time to address the needs and desires of the community. Um, emergency powers of the board and electronic meetings. I'm actually going to talk about those two all in one. COVID, right? COVID threw everybody for a loop. Everybody's like, well, what on earth, what can we do? Can we shut down the common elements? Can we keep people out of the clubhouse? You know, what do we do in the, in the face of this pandemic? So you should update your emergency powers of the board to address specifically what the board can do in the face of a pandemic or health crisis or other type of issue. Most of the emergency powers that we've had in Florida have all been written to address hurricanes, but the hurricane restrictions didn't really apply to COVID. It was a completely different issue. So you want to make sure that it applies. And while we do have some statutes that have been enacted since COVID to kind of help, uh, they don't really get you all the way there. So you want to have something in the bylaws. That would be a bylaw provision, by the way, to address emergency powers of, of the board in these types of situations. And the same with electronic meetings. We get a lot of questions to our firm. You know, can we continue with electronic meetings now that the health crisis is, is over? And um, our position has been, yes, but you need to be able to accommodate people that can't attend by, you know, computer if they don't have a computer. I mean, they, believe it or not, especially in older communities, there are people that either don't have computers or aren't comfortable working with them. They don't know how to work in and out of Zoom meetings. Um, and if they request an accommodation, you have to be able to do that. And we recommend having those provisions in your bylaws to specifically permit electronic meetings subject to accommodations when necessary. Um, so those are the electronic meetings and documents. Uh, Shauna, do you do we have time to run through the real quick saving yeah. money? If you want to just jump, okay. Yeah. If anybody, if anybody needs to jump off, just I guess I'll throw out there. If anybody needs to jump off, yeah. um, please go ahead. We will. Laura and I, by the end of the week, will be sending out a link to the video recording of this. Oh, um, no. That means people can see all my mistakes over and over again. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, and then, then, like, so, is it too late to check? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Monique is fine with it. We can actually attach this whole little outline um, as well. And so, yeah, so if anybody needs to jump off because um, we're running over a bit, please go ahead and we'll, you won't miss. We'll send you the video. Um, otherwise, yeah, go ahead. And then anybody who had questions that we didn't get to, feel free to stay on as well. And we'll address those quickly um, when Monique finishes up here. And Shauna, if you want, you can always send out my contact information with that. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if, if necessary. To the extent I can, if we're not your counsel, I may refer you to your counsel. Um, but if you don't have counsel, then I can certainly answer your questions. Or if you're one of my clients, of course, I'm happy to help. So yeah, um, we will include your contact in, we'll send an email with your contact information and with the link to the video. Okay. 
All right, so real quick, we'll run through ways to save money. So the very first one, please, 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 don't try to draft the amendments yourself. Don't appoint a committee to draft the amendments. Just understand when I tell you this is not a way for us to make money. This is a way for you to save money. One, because the statutes are specific about the underlining and strike through. If you give me a document that you've amended, the very first thing that I need to do before I can even get into the substantive part of your amendments is figure out if you've done all the underlining and strike through correctly. And that can take hours. And unfortunately, that's not something that I would delegate to a paralegal here. So that is hours of attorney time, just checking underlying and strike through. That is not something you want to pay us to do at all. Also, when you use redline documents, um, when you actually let the computer do the underlining and strike through for you, um, the computer is not as smart as you are sometimes. And they when you have multiple changes to it, then it can actually eventually stray from the original content and can mess that up as well. So um, believe me when I tell you, you absolutely do not want to try to draft these by yourself. Also, a lot of times what happens is a committee or um, the board or even an individual person will invest so many hours and so much time and work and effort into doing something um, to what they believe is gonna help the community and save money in the long run. And I personally feel awful when I have to approach, you know, the, the board, the committee or the person and say, you know, I'm really sorry, but I can't use any of your work product or in order for me to use your work product, it's going to cost you twice as much. Um, it's I just I feel bad. I feel really, really bad because, you know, the person has really worked in and done everything. And, and it's again, it's not that things are wrong. It's simply that without a deep understanding of how cases are coming down, how courts are interpreting certain things, exactly how the statutes are written, it's just not helpful for you to try to draft them yourself. It will, I promise you, will not save you money. Um, better approach is prepare a list of the issues that you want to address. And if there's a way that you want to see something drafted. So for example, if you want your pet restrictions to allow pets for owners, not allow pets for tenants, to make sure people are picking up after their pets, to not permit electronic, you know, collars, or at least not without a visible handheld leash, just put that in a side note, just say, you know, this is what we want our pet restrictions to say and use your own, your own terminology. I'll know what you're meaning. And then I'll be able to put that into the right legalese for you. Um, same with leasing amendments. You know, we, we don't want people to be able to lease in the first year. Don't try to draft that yourself. Just tell me. And, and I can then take your comments and the things that you think are a big issue and use your guidance to draft in the amendments the way that you would want to see them. Um, once you get the first version of the amendments, whether it's an individual amendment or whether it's an amended and restated, I always find that it's very, very helpful for you to submit questions, comments, and requested revisions in writing before scheduling a phone call with our office to go over all of them. A lot of our clients want to talk through them, and thats I have no problem talking through them. I, I love having um, conversations with our clients, meetings, and everything else. But what happens is if you wait to discuss it in a meeting, First, we discuss it, then I have to write notes about it, and then I have to go back to the document, and then I have to go through all my notes and make all those changes and then get everything back to you, and then there may be, that may generate more questions and comments. When you provide the comments and questions and suggested or requested revisions up front, you'd be surprised how often we can go ahead and make that and answer that question in writing very, very quickly, and then what you get back is another advanced version of the document that's consistent with everything that you requested, then schedule the phone call to talk about anything that requires further discussion, further clarification, or, you know, if I couldn't make a certain change because the law wouldn't allow that type of change, you know, why? We can talk about that. So it's better to first respond in writing, let a second version be drafted, then schedule a call to discuss any last, li last little things rather than just jumping on a call and trying to go through, you know, 50 different questions that you have and then having to go back and amend the document afterwards. Um, Hold workshop meetings with your members before, and, and this really gets to um, the issue that 
we talked about a little bit in advance with notice and when you should send the documents out. Again, your, your members will be um, very supportive of the project typically when they're involved from the onset. So if you hold workshops with your members, you allow them to give feedback, what they like, what they don't like. And then even after you have the first draft, maybe send that out to the members, allow them to give feedback. Then you're working into a document that you've gotten all of the preliminary feedback from your members before it even goes to a membership vote. I've seen a lot of times where the board will talk about what they want to do in board meetings. But you know what? Unless people really are given a lot of, um, I don't know, fanfare about, hey, come to this board meeting because we're going to be talking about the amendments, they tend to ignore board meeting notices. And they don't, I mean, at least most communities I've seen, board meetings aren't very well attended unless there's really a specific reason that you're inviting the members to attend. So what will happen is the board will have five or six meetings before the drafting even begins. Nobody shows up to the meetings. They send it to my office. I do the amendments. They send the amendment out for the membership vote and people come back yelling and screaming, we were never involved. You never asked us. There's no transparency here. And they're all fired up about everything. When the board actually did have meetings to talk about it and nobody showed. So I would say, don't just put it on a regular agenda of your board meetings. Send out big notices. Hey, you know, we want to have a, a workshop or you guys use the term that, um, that I'm, I'm drawing a blank on. A town hall. Town hall meeting. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. We have a town hall meeting to talk about our documents. There'll be refreshments served. You know, come and participate. Let us know what you like, what things are working, what things aren't working, and try to get the members really involved in the process as much as possible. Also invite them to submit questions and comments and requests in writing. So if they can't come to a town hall meeting, you know, email us with certain things you'd like to see changed in the governing documents so we can consider that then they feel like they're part of that interactive process. So that way, when you get to the actual voting, you're not getting that, that pushback of, you never told us, you know, we didn't know that was being discussed at the board meeting. So um, I think that's it. I think that gets us through all of it. I was going fast, so I might've missed something. So I apologize no. if I did, but- I think we have great questions. Yeah, we've got questions. Um, Let's see, uh, Mitch asked if short-term leasing fees are higher than long-term leasing fee, is there a liability for the board? So in other words, the, if you're talking about the application, application, it sounds like an application fee. They're charging more for a short-term. Mitch, if you want to clarify, if you're still on, you can. Um, um, if it's just the application fee, it's different than a... If the application fee, so the... Your declaration, first of all, your declaration has to provide for the permit you to charge an application fee. So if the declaration permits you to charge an application fee, you have to go by what your declaration says. If it says the application fee shall be $100, that's what it has to be. If your declaration doesn't say the amount, then it can be, you know, if there's a reasonable basis, I'm not- You said application fee, just to clarify okay. money. So I'm not- quite clicking on why the short term is more than the long term, unless you're trying to discourage short term, because typically a long term, you would have the background check and everything else. So usually that would be more. Um, so it may be found, it may be questionable. Um, if the whole, only reason you're doing it is to discourage short term leasing, it, it's better to have other rules that would discourage short term leasing. But there's nothing that I'm aware of in the statute, definitely not in the statutes and not in case law that I can think of sitting here today that says that you couldn't have an amount that is, you know, the, the statutory maximum, which, by the way, right now is one hundred and fifty dollars for long term leases or for short term leases and then charge something less for a long term lease. Um, as long as there's a reasonable basis. Remember the law says that the board can adopt policies, but those policies have to have a reasonable basis that's not arbitrary, capricious, or discriminatory on its face. So um, again, I'm not popping anything right away that says you absolutely can't do it, but those are the parameters that you have to, um, you have to consider. And without being able to look at some arbitration decisions or, or court decisions, I can't say whether that's been challenged or not off the top of my head. You want me to read the next one, Sean? I was going to go with Pam, Pam asked, uh, someone told us that the legal documents were no longer allowed to have the strike through or underlying things, and we were in violation according to her attorney, and then we must get them redone. Our original declaration has those. Are we in violation? 
I have no idea what your attorney's talking about. It's not <laughs> very clear. I mean, really, really clear that it has to have underlying and strike through. And I, I, I have no clue what, what that attorney is talking about. All right. That, yeah. I thought the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Katrina asks. That's uh, the type of attorney that you don't want to do your amended and restated that question. There you go. <laughs> or, or make sure that they're, that they're truly an attorney in HOA and condo law. Yes. Yes. Um, in Florida. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. Florida. Florida is different. Um, there, right, yeah. so, what are we not which, different in? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Katrina asks, do we know where we can find the Florida statute for fines? Also, does the HOA have to have a committee in place outside of the HOA board members for assessing fines? Okay, so it is uh, this condominium. HOA. HOA 720. You're really taxing me on this one. Yeah, 720. <laughs> I know you does this. You should just document, document 720. You do have a fining committee. Yeah, you, well, you definitely find a committee. I'm just trying to think of the actual number. It's in it's in chapter 720. I oh. can't. Think of it. I, I think it's. I'm going to say 306, but no, I, maybe not 306. But um, but you have to have a finding committee. So what's happened, and that's a really good question. Um, rewind maybe two years ago, might even be more because time passes so fast now. There's like pre-COVID era and post-COVID era. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> those are the only two time frames that exist now anymore. Right. But Years ago, the way the statute read, and it still does say an opportunity for a hearing, and all the legal practitioners, including our office, took the position that because it said an opportunity for a hearing, that when you sent out a notice of a proposed fine, you could make it incumbent on the homeowner to request a hearing in front of an impartial committee. And if they did not request a hearing, a committee did not need to be formed and they did not actually have to approve or you know, deny the fine. What's happened since then is a change in the law said that the fine becomes due and owing after it's approved by the committee. Because the only time a fine can now become due and owing is after it's approved by the committee, then the fact that it says opportunity for committing the specific governs over the general. So that has now been interpreted to mean across the board for all condos, HOAs, and cooperatives that you have to actually assemble a committee and the committee needs to review the fine and uphold it in order for it to become due and owing from the homeowner, regardless of whether the homeowner requested or attends the hearing. So it was that one little nuance in the law that changed everything. That's why. Yeah. Yep. And no board board members can't sit on that committee, correct? Correct. No board correct. members, yep. nobody in the home of a board member, right? Yep. All right. Another one about fines. Uh, Jasmine asked if the HOA has fining fees and process, what happens if, next if the owner pays the fine, is what she's stating, and does not change the modification that was requested? Yeah. That's the problem, especially in the condo world, um, because you can fine up to a thousand dollars, but if they don't change the behavior, what good does it do you? Now you have a thousand dollar fine on the books. You can't lean for it. If they don't pay it, are you really going to take them to court for a thousand dollars? No, you got to take them to court for injunctive relief to force them to comply with the governing documents. Because if you don't, then you wind up with selective enforcement issues. So fines are really mediocre when it comes to enforcement. The, the real key is enforcing the behavior. And that's why that whole self-help thing becomes a, a problem too. So in the HOA, again, it can be a little bit more helpful because if you reach the thousand dollar mark and go beyond that in a cumulative fine, then you can lean for it and that, that gets people's attention. Um, but in the condo world, yeah, you really kind of have to begin the enforcement process and bring a lawsuit for injunctive relief if it gets to right. It. All right, we've got another question, Susan, on finding hearings. Um, uh, Susan asks, does the hearing committee hear arguments based on merit or just procedure with a homeowner? No, both. Both they can, they should hear it based on merit and, and procedures, but they need to understand the finding committee needs to really understand that whether they violated procedure is still a problem because, you know, here's a really good example. Somebody fails to submit an application for an architectural improvement. They go ahead and they install the architectural improvement, which looks beautiful and would have been approved. And so you don't want your finding committee to be like, well, you know, we would have approved it anyways, so we're not going to uphold the fine. The procedure is still important because people need to follow procedure. So there's both merit and procedure that the finding committee should be considering. All right, we've got two more questions. Um, I'll read Patricia. If the articles state at 50, a 51% membership vote is required to amend the articles 
and the bylaws and the declaration state that there must be a 75% membership to amend either of those two documents, is there a conflict? So no, the each document can have its own amendment pr provision that is completely different from the others. And in fact, a lot of times the declaration has a higher threshold, a larger amount to amend than the bylaws and the articles will. Um, what you have to be careful of is I have seen very sloppy drafting where contained in one of the three documents, it will say, you know, the bylaws and articles may be amended by 75% of the homeowners. And then the bylaws will say these bylaws may be amended by 51% of the homeowners. If the articles have a provision that say the bylaws need to be amended by 75% and the bylaws have a provision that says 51%, the articles are actually going to control for two reasons. One, because it's the more restrictive provision and because in the hierarchy of governing documents, the declaration controls over the articles and the bylaws, the articles control over the bylaws. So you, you have to be careful if there's any conflict in them and you're gonna go with the more restrictive, but it's very, very common for the three documents to have different amendment procedures and there's nothing wrong with that. Perfect. And then one last question, Kendall says, uh, we have an owner who owns two condominiums, each hat with an assigned locker, I can't find out how the lockers were originally assigned. Nothing is in the documents. He wants to reassign the lockers between the two condos. Uh, looks like, does this change need to be board or member approval or need, I guess, need to have board or member approval? And does a change have to be filed with the county? Okay. I've never, uh, yeah. I think I'm following that. And unfortunately, it's going to be one of those questions that I have to say, you really need to look at what your declaration says. So the fact that you can't find the original assignments is not where you're going to have the biggest problem. If you can't find the original assignments, you absolutely should audit all of the locker assignments now as a board and get those, you know, assigned or not assigned, but, but get that in on record. You want to make sure, okay, this is how they exist as of April X of 2023. And this is what we know, actually, April's almost over. So it might take into May to audit all of those, but try to figure out what lockers have been and are assigned to all the unit owners, get that document in place. And then your declaration is going to tell you, first of all, can they be transferred among unit owners? Um, typically they can. They usually, most documents will allow you to assign freely among unit owners. You can't assign them to you know, non-unit owners because they're an appurtenance to the unit, but usually you can assign them among unit owners. But here's where we have to be careful. If you remember when I was talking about a park, uh, parking spaces and changing the appurtenances, if he owns two lockers because he owns two units and each locker is a pertinent to a unit, he cannot transfer one locker over to another unit so that one unit has two lockers and the other unit doesn't have any if those lockers are appurtenances to the units. I can't tell you without looking at your declaration. So you really want to seek advice of counsel to get that answered for sure. But it very well may be that he could swap them. He could transfer, you know, if unit one and unit two have locker C and lockers D, they can swap lockers. I, I don't think that would ordinarily be a problem, but you probably cannot transfer one locker to the other and one have two and the other have none. Um, and as far as whether or not it has to be recorded, if your document, if your declaration says that it has to be recorded, then yes, but I routinely amend those provisions out because it's really typically not important to have it recorded in the public records and it can be more of a pain than it's worth as long as the association maintains those records as part of its official records. So that is something that you can amend out of your declaration so that you don't have to record in the public records every time a locker assignment is changed. Um, but again, it all generates from the original wording of your declaration. You gotta go back to that to really kind of get good answers to those questions. Great, well, that was a really good that was a really good webinar. <laughs> yeah. Lots I'm of good sorry it took so long. I told you, I warned you guys, I could talk all day about this. <laughs> no, this is fantastic though. I mean, I, and everybody um, stayed on up until um, pretty, we've had a few people drop off literally in the last couple of Just minutes, now. like as you've gone through the questions, <laughs> but otherwise everybody stayed on. So obviously you keep, you kept everybody engaged. So it was a good <laughs> run, run over. <laughs> I'm glad. Yes. Yeah, it was really it just good. whatever you do, don't send me the recording because I will be tempted to watch it and then I will be forever mortified about how I look on camera or how I sound because you know our voices don't sound to us like they do to everybody else. So I don't, don't ever watch the recordings. I don't either. <laughs>
<laughs> for, the same, for the same reason. <laughs> but, well, um, um, thank, thank you, Monique. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys very, very much. Yes. And thank know, you that's... Guys for attending. I appreciate yes. you guys listening to me. Yes. Thank you. thank you, everybody. We appreciate everybody. And like we said, we'll send um, everybody out an email with information. And um, thank you, Monique. This is fantastic. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. And we look forward to doing, with, doing it with you again here in the future. I hope so. Next time, I promise I'll actually have another PowerPoint like it, that, that you don't have to create for me, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we're um, happy to help. All right. Take Bye. care, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.